some parts of California had more than fireworks for 4th of July. I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Josh Basham, founder and CEO of Early Warning Labs. Welcome, Josh. So for those of you who may not remember, um, what does Early Warning Labs do, Josh? And what do you, what came about, how did the company come about? Sure. Early Warning Labs is a earthquake early warning technology integrator, right? So we do everything from uh, delivering earthquake early warnings through mobile phones via uh, applications, uh, all the way down to integrating hardware into commercial systems. So it's like PA systems in schools to fire alarms within um, high-rise buildings to actually play the audible alert. And we do that through our partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey. And through that partnership, we get access to what's called the shake alert data. And that shake alert data comes from roughly about a thousand seismic sensors that they monitor real time on the West Coast. Southern California, where you're located, just experienced a pair of mid-magnitude earthquakes. The ground is in fact still buzzing with aftershocks. Tell us about the event and how your system has performed. Sure. So the whole team at Early Warning Labs, uh, it's safe to say that we did not celebrate the 4th of July like uh, most of Americans did. We were uh, busy buzzing away, checking our stats, making sure our logs and everything and all our systems performed well. And we were very, very pleased that they, they performed well. Um, the first event, which was on the 4th, that was a, a 6.4 magnitude earthquake. And then the second event the following day was a 7.1. So I mean, those were the biggest earthquakes we've had here in recent memory that we've been able to feel in the Los Angeles area. Um, and at the least the biggest in the last 20 years since Northridge. Uh, what was, I, I, I don't wanna say what was good about that event because no big earthquake is ever a good scenario. I mean, they're out in Ridgecrest, there are families' lives that have just been uprooted, right? Burnt homes people displaced, uh, but it was still the, the most ideal scenario we could have had to prove the system, prove the shake alert system, prove the early warning labs technology, whether that's our mobile application quake alert or commercial integrations uh, with organizations and companies and schools out here. Um, it was the, the perfect scenario because it was big, the sensors got it, we were able to prove that that whole system worked, and nobody died, right? There were some minor injuries, and of course, some of the homes were lost. Um, but we got to see a big earthquake. And that big earthquake, if it was 100 miles closer to LA, would have been a deadly, deadly earthquake, and the system would have performed well, and we would have been able to save lives, which is, which is huge. Residents of the Los Angeles area expressed concern that there was no early warning issued for the city, even though the city has the ability to deliver early warning. So what happened there? Sure. So users of our technology platform, uh, Early Warning Labs, our mobile applications, Quake Alert, and our commercial integration uh, is similarly named CloudQuake. All of our users got the notifications at the thresholds that they were set. So our mobile application users, uh, if they had earthquakes that I can feel or all earthquakes selected, they got the notification. Our commercial users, if their notification threshold was below intensity three, we triggered their commercial system, whether that's recalling elevators, playing audible alerts. And we had a handful of commercial customers who actually had thresholds that were below the shaking that was felt here in LA. Uh, some of the systems that we had installed had higher thresholds uh, because they're okay with a little bit of shaking, which in reality throughout LA, you know, it was the highest was maybe intensity four, which really, I mean, you're lucky if that'll knock over a, a wine glass, right? So some of the big hospitals were integrated with, um, a lot of the, the critical systems like the LA Metro system were connected to, their thresholds were, were, were much higher than um, just a little bit of shaking. So those systems weren't triggered and that's good because the system worked the way that it was supposed to. The lower thresholds got triggered while the higher thresholds didn't. And that's great. And that's exactly what we wanted. So our system worked really well. There are some other systems out there. Um, I know the city was working on one, uh, ShakeAlert LA, separate from our system. It's also separate from the USGS system, which is ShakeAlert, 
they share a similar name because it's utilizing the technology, but it's completely that's completely run separately from the USGS. Um, they didn't build the technology. They didn't build the app. They don't run it. Uh, they just helped with some of the content and, of course, uh, provided the data feed. So that mobile application is set up much differently than ours. Uh, the thresholds, um, the way that they monitor earthquakes, whether they're in or out of the Lake County, is much different than the way that we do it. We monitor all the earthquakes throughout the entire West Coast, and we will notify our customers or our users if that's going to affect them. And we do that by monitoring each individual user. And that's much more expensive, right? But we feel that's the right way to do it. Because if we're gonna launch our, our free app to the entire state, which we're planning on towards the end of summer, if not a little bit later, we want it to be the best possible product. And we want it to alert the end users. And we want the end user to be empowered to say, you know what, I wanna get uh, the same alert at the threshold, say a hospital would at four. Or if it's a family and their kids are deathly afraid of earthquakes, you know, let's let them know if it's even just going to shake a tiny bit so they can go and wake up the kids and say everything's going to be okay. So that's the way that we approach the technology. Um, and we allow people, we educate people to make that choice for, for themselves. And, um, you know, we're able to tell them exactly how bad the shaking is going to be you know, right in their immediate area. So we think that's a very valuable piece. And, you know, when it comes down to saving lives, and that's ultimately why we do this, we want it to be the best solution. You say that you're not in the business of predicting quakes. You actually try to outrun them. You talked about levels earlier. So what signals do your sensors look for? And how does that information actually get transmitted to your customers? Right. Do you want to do a little earthquake early warning 101? Yeah. Sounds good. All right. So think of earthquake early warning as thunder and lightning, right? You're sitting on the porch, you see a flash of lightning. You see that first. Then, you know, you count one, 1,000, two, 1,000, then you hear the thunder. And that's because light travels faster than sound. Think of earthquake seismic waves as sound waves. And theoretically, P waves are sound waves. So when you have an earthquake at the epicenter, they emit two different types of um, seismic waves. P waves which are the little bit faster traveling sound waves. Then you have the S waves afterwards, the shear waves. The S waves are what you typically feel, and that's typically what causes the damage. So it's a good thing because those travel slower than the S waves, okay? So when the earthquake happens, if we can use sensors placed strategically by the fault lines to detect those P waves, and theoretically transmit a warning ahead of even the P waves, because remember the P waves are traveling roughly at the speed of sound, we can transmit and detect at the speed of light. So even if an earth, you know, a, a lightning and thunder, you can count five, six, seven seconds before you hear it. Think how much time we can actually outrun this earthquake if it's the same, same theory. So that's really what it is. We're outrunning the earthquake. We're detecting it real time as it's happening and we're outrunning the damaging S waves. And that's how we're able to get 10, 15, best case scenario, 60 seconds here in LA for the next earthquake. So, so what can you do with those seconds? Let's say 30 seconds of advance notice. What are the dangers people in urban or suburban settings can, can mitigate? So there's two, two pieces that I find really fascinating about this. The first, okay, is it takes two seconds, three to five seconds to drop, cover, hold on under a sturdy piece of furniture like, like our desk here, our, our conference table. That can mitigate half of the death and injury in a big earthquake, half, right? So even with just a little bit of warning time, 10 seconds, right? On the worst, worst case, right? 10 seconds, five seconds of warning. You can still get your plate, you get yourself to a safe spot. But what's even scarier to me is UC Berkeley, USGS did a study called the Haywired scenario. And your viewers, I suggest they go and, and Google this. Then get it to PDF. It talks about what would happen if they had a large earthquake on the Hayward Fault up by San Francisco. They said 20,000 people are gonna get stuck in elevators, 20,000. So you may think of that, oh, that's fine. I'm gonna get stuck there for five, 10 minutes and then the fire department comes and gets me. No, because the top three priorities for the fire department are gonna be fires, helping at the hospitals for all the injured people and helping evacuate patients. Schools, helping out the kids, getting kids out of a, say a partially collapsed building. You being stuck in an elevator and perfectly fine, perfectly healthy, maybe you just had lunch, they'll leave you in there for days. 
That's what scares me. So our platform, and we do this today with our commercial platform, we actually connect into the fire alarm panels. We play the alert over the voice evacuation system, the PA system where they do announcements to the fire panel, and we connect to elevator control. We'll take the elevator to the closest floor, open the doors, and hold it there until the shaking stops. So we can completely mitigate 20,000 people being trapped in elevators in San Francisco if we can get this technology adopted, implemented, and code required and get this all deployed throughout all the new elevators within the cities. But we do that now for folks that opt in and we got to give our customers credit. You know, they're, they're open to spending a little bit of money to get that extra level of protection for their tenants or residents or whoever. Tell us about the Quake Alert app. Sure. Yeah. So Quake Alert is our mobile application. Uh, we've been in a closed beta now for, uh, for the last probably two years. Um, we work on a strict uh, timeline and allocation with the USGS. They say you can have X amount of people utilizing the app, give us you know, data for those test users, tell us how fast it worked. Uh, even for this event, right? We shared our average alerting time and our speed and all those, those calculations with them to show them, hey, this is a reliable product. Um, we got approval to be able to launch this in the entire state of California. And we're really proud of that. So that's what we're working towards now. Um, you know, we're, we, we, of course, have to apologize to our, our extensive wait lists of people that just we couldn't let in, right? We didn't have enough spaces to allow these users to have access to the, the pilot. And we feel bad. You know, there's people that have been waiting a year, six months to be able to utilize the app, but we just didn't have the approvals to be able to add those people. But the good news is, the wait is almost over and uh, we're going to be able to add the rest of those users and everyone else in the state very soon. So that's, that's very, very exciting. That is great news. Josh, thank you so much for joining. If somebody wants to connect with you, how can they do that? Sure. They can go to our website, earlywarninglabs.com. We actually have the data that people can actually look at and see the performance of the mobile application. They can see that their average warning time for our users here in LA for a mobile app was about 45 seconds, which was pretty cool. Uh, there's a link at the top, which has a whole sort of press release talking about the performance and who was activated and who got alerts. Uh, they can also click and get more information about our mobile app. They can sign up for the wait list and the newsletter to get updates. And if they want to follow us on Twitter, uh, it's early warning lab on Twitter, not S because too many characters. So it's early warning lab, uh, singular. And then of course they can search that on, uh, on Facebook as well. Follow us there. Sounds good. Again, that was Josh Basham, founder of Early Warning Labs. If you guys want to find me, you can. You can do that right here or go to tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.